For many around the world, it's difficult to imagine Christmas without the iconic Christmas tree, trimmed with beautiful decorations and colored lights. Children feel the excitement welling up inside them at the sight of it, and parents recall memories of their own childhood days beneath its boughs. The custom has proved so endearing that it's been taken up all around the world, with large Christmas trees not an infrequent sight in public spaces around the holiday period, in large cities in Japan and even China. Yet despite its now worldwide fame, its roots are planted firmly in more local soil. Let's discover the origin of this special tree that has so captured the hearts of people around the world. Hi friends, I'm Kevin McLean. My voice is a little rougher than usual because of a cold. But don't forget to hit like, share, and subscribe and consider supporting the channel through Patreon or PayPal. It's very much appreciated. It's hard to say exactly when the evergreen tree, either pine or fir, was first used in celebrations around the period of the winter solstice. Some trace it back to the Roman Saturnalia, saying that evergreen branches decorated Roman homes during the holiday. Websites and popular magazines repeat this, though sometimes changing the ethnic group, saying that Druids in Britain and Northern Europe used to decorate homes and temples with pine, spruce, and fir, and of course mistletoe. There are some later customs of various European peoples that may give credence to such a view, but I have never found in ancient or medieval sources directly attesting to this practice, nor have I seen anyone give a citation for this claim. So, while we should not discount the possibility that this did happen, the claim is very likely based on assumptions rather than fact. The earliest claimed association between the fir tree and the Christian religion is said to have come from an account of St. Boniface, an English monk who led a mission into the Germanic pagan regions of the Frankish Empire in the early 700s. He became famous, or more correctly, infamous, for the great crime of destroying the sacred oak of Donar, the old High German rendering of Thunraz, cognate with Norse Thor. It's been repeated on some websites and in books that after Boniface felled the tree, he pointed to a young fir growing amidst the roots and said, This tree is a symbol of the true God because its leaves never fall, and he related its triangular shape to the Trinity. This does not appear in the medieval account of the saint, however, or in any other known medieval source. The origin of this claim lies with Mary Lewis Harvey, who wrote in 1912 a piece called How St. Boniface Kept Christmas. It's a fictional account of the saint's doings, where she has him confronting druids, despite being among the Germanic peoples. She directly copies the account of the Druid ritual from Pliny the Elder, while adding an incantation they supposedly gave to Thor. He cuts down the tree, praises the fir as a symbol of the new religion of the Christ Child, and converts all the Druids, lighting the first candles on a Christmas tree. In short, it's Christian fan fiction. Well before 1913, the Christmas tree had already become a normal part of the Christmas celebrations in English and German-speaking regions, and the author just simply backdates this and presents it as if it had been some eternal part of the Christmas celebration. It's amazing how one fictional version of St. Boniface led to such a widely repeated notion. What is true is that these types of evergreen trees, fir or pine, held a special meaning in ancient Roman and Greek religion. One can find it associated with Mercury in his role as the guide of the dead, with the Thracian god Sabazios, who holds the pine cone, and the Egyptian Osiris, who had a ritual where a pine log was hollowed out and his effigy was placed within. All of these associations are linked to the cycle of life and death, and hint perhaps at rebirth. Mercury guides souls into the underworld, but also out of it. A myth of Dionysus said he was torn to pieces by the Titans, but later reborn. 
He is strongly connected to the life cycle of plants, especially vigorous growing grapes that must be continually pruned in order to produce fruit. Sabazios and Osiris are likewise linked to the cycle of life, and their power is connected to the annual growth and hibernation of plants. Yet the pine or fir and its cone are symbols of the ever-present life, for it does not lose its leaves, and when fires come and burn down the trees, the seeds of the pine cones spread and grow. These trees, symbolized by their cones, came to represent an idea of cyclical immortality. The pine or fir was also connected to the goddess Sibella and Attis, a Phrygian god of vegetation. The Roman poet Ovid said, Pines high girdled in a leafy crest, the favorite of the gods, great mother, since in this tree Attis of Sibella doffed his human shape and stiffened in its trunk. Poseidon's holy tree was also a pine. Its resin was used for waterproofing and its wood for shipbuilding. While trees were venerated by pagans across Europe, and practices involving the burning of a Yule log are very widespread among different ethnic groups in Europe. The specific practice of the Christmas tree appears to be much more localized. It is said the earliest reference to a Christmas tree is found in the regiment the Cistercian Order of 15th century Portugal. It says, Note on how to put the Christmas branch. On the Christmas Eve you will look for a large branch of green laurel and you shall reap many red oranges and place them on the branches that come of the laurel, specifically as you have seen, and in every orange you shall put a candle and hang the branch by a rope in the pole, which shall be by the candle of the high altar. While there are similarities here to the Christmas tradition, note that it is a branch of the laurel tree suspended from a rope. If plants were used in the Saturnalia, it may have also been the laurel. Yet one must admit that this laurel cutting practice is a far cry from what we know as a Christmas tree. The earliest dated image of a Christmas tree is claimed to be found on a private cornerstone of a home in Turkheim, now part of France, dated to 1576. You would think it would be the kind of thing that Turkheim would be pointing out as a tourist attraction or something but there doesn't seem to be much about it anywhere on the net, and not a single picture could I find. But it's likely true. This was originally a German town, and the people most strongly connected with spreading the Christmas tree tradition were Germans. But even though Turkheim holds the oldest representation of a Christmas tree, the earliest recorded mention of a real Christmas tree comes from an account of the practices of the Brotherhood of the Blackheads. Their origin is rooted in a group of foreign merchants in Tallinn, Estonia, who protected the church and Christians when the local pagan population rebelled and tried to drive out the Christian German occupiers between 1343 and 1345. Those foreigners in Estonia were mostly Germans and Danes, who had come as part of the Livonian Crusade, led by the Holy Roman Empire and the Kingdom of Denmark and Estonia had remained largely under Danish occupation ever since. The rebellion was going well until the Teutonic Order arrived and crushed it with brutality. The Brotherhood was a military brotherhood that organized for the defense of the German occupation, and they were said to have set up a Christmas tree in their guild hall as early as 1441, and they would bring it to the town hall square at Christmas and dance around it. The black Egyptian Saint Maurice was their patron saint, possibly why they were called the Blackheads, though they may have chosen the saint based on the name. Either way, it's a bit odd. What is also odd is that we would find the earliest Christmas tree account associated with this Christian military brotherhood. Now, if the Christmas tree, as we know it, began with the early pagan practices of the Estonians and Latvians, as many proud Estonians and Latvians claim, we would expect the last people to adopt it to be the Blackheads, who murdered local pagans in the name of Christ. 
as the blackheads were made up primarily of people of German backgrounds who were occupying Estonian lands. It's possible that they brought the custom there rather than adopting a local pagan one. But possibly it was a custom common to both regions. The guild was not only active in Tallinn, but also throughout Germany. In Bremen in 1570, it's recorded in guild records that a tree was set up in the guild hall and decorated with treats that would be enjoyed by the children of the guild members on Christmas Day. By 1777, German immigrants to the United States were recorded as placing Christmas trees in Connecticut. And in 1781, General Frederick Adolf Redesel set up a fir tree in Sorrel, Quebec, decorated with candles and fruit. Queen Charlotte is said to have set up the first known Christmas tree in England in 1800. Queen Victoria wrote of the custom in 1832, saying, After dinner, then we went into the drawing room near the dining room. There were two large round tables on which were placed two trees hung with lights and sugar ornaments, all the presents being placed round the trees. What all of these accounts of first known Christmas trees have in common is that from our earliest in 1441 to its earliest representation in Turkheim to its adoption into Britain and the New World is that all of these representations come from German sources. It strongly suggests that the tradition is native to German people and it likely existed long before it's first recorded that militant Christian orders were participating in it as early as the 15th century means it didn't possess a pagan connotation for them at the time because they'd grown up around it so that it was just part of the culture and had probably become attached to some type of Christian explanation. Though very likely the custom of the Christmas tree does go back to a pagan practice around the winter solstice with the tree representing the force of life and light during the darkest times of winter. However, as with many folk customs, there isn't the documentation to prove this. Dancing around the tree is recorded in many of the early accounts, however, and this speaks of an original pagan custom, most of which involve dancing. We can compare it to the May Day festival with the dancing around the maypole. Its symbolism was not, as is sometimes suggested, the world tree. The world tree in Indo-European myth is generally the oak tree. The only known exception to this is the Norse traditions in which it's an ash. The evergreen tree in relation to Christmas carries the same meaning as the ancient Greek and Roman use of the pine cone, relating to light and the hope of the coming spring, rebirth, renewal, regeneration. These qualities are all mentioned in the 1824 version of O Tannenbaum. And though my voice doesn't allow me to sing right now, I will read out some of the lyrics to you that detail this association. O Tannenbaum, O Tannenbaum, with what delight I see you. When winter days are dark and drear, you bring us hope for all the year. O Tannenbaum, O Tannenbaum, with what delight I see you. O Tannenbaum, O Tannenbaum, you bear a joyful message that faith and hope shall ever bloom to bring us light in winter's gloom. I'd like to thank you all for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, stand tall.